Very interesting. Uh, Paul Moss there on the death of Pavel Antov, who was fallen out of a hotel window while holidaying in India. Uh, we will be back with the headlines uh, very shortly. Just a reminder that you can reach me and the team on Twitter. I am at C Fraser BBC. We're going to go to a short break. Do stay with us. BBC World News, the biggest African and international news stories. Focus on Africa. This is Focus on Africa. I'm Lucrezia Burak. Our top stories. A delegation of Ethiopian federal officials are in the Tigrayan capital, Mekele, for the first time in more than a year and a half. A sign of improving relations, perhaps. When they go low, we go high. The battery swap scheme hoping to revolutionise the electric motorcycle industry in the Kenyan capital. Also in the programme, harnessing digital communication for Ivorians. The country's first locally made smartphone opening up, opening up a world of communication with indigenous language voice commands. And in the sport today, all hands on deck with a crew of South African sailors making history on the high seas, hoping for fair winds in the legendary Cape to Rio yacht race. Hello and welcome to Focus on Africa, coming to you from BBC World News. The TPLF rebel leader, Debrazion Gabra Michel, says that full peace will not return to Ethiopia's Tigray region until Eritrean troops and Amhara militia leave the rest of northern region. He said it was unacceptable for half of Tigray to be peaceful whilst massacres continue elsewhere. The rebel leader was speaking during the first visit to the region by a high-level government delegation since the war began more than two years ago. Now, last week, the government began the gradual lifting of a blockade on food and medical aid to the region, as well as restoring banking and telecommunications. And on Tuesday, Ethiopian Airlines announced the resumption of flights to the regional capital, Mekele. Now, this warming of relations comes after the two sides signed an African Union brokered peace agreement in South Africa on the 2nd of November. An agreement on the disarmament of the TPLF was also signed later in the month, this time in Kenya. Well, let's discuss this further. Joining me now from Addis Ababa is the BBC's Kalkadan Yiboltel. Hello there, Kalkadan. Um, is this a milestone, milestone moment? Is it fair to, to say that? What happened today? Uh, yes, indeed, it's 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 a, a milestone moment. Uh, the, the delegation members of the, the delegation have uh, have returned to Addis Ababa. It was a short trip, but uh, it was one filled with uh, important uh, symbolic and practical significance. Uh, it, it's speaking symbolically, as as you said, this is the first time that a senior government delegation is traveling to that grand capital in uh, more than a year and a half, and there was uh, image coming out from Macale uh, in which you know government officials and uh, uh, leaders of the ground forces were uh, shaking hands and then smiling and then uh, you know exchanging this cordial sentiment so that that you know, that sends a message to people in Tigray as well as in the rest of Ethiopia uh, that things uh, are indeed improving and progresses are indeed being made uh, but in terms of practicality as well they, we are already seeing the impact of this trip uh, for, for the past few, few weeks we have seen the slow uh, restoration of basic services to some 
some Tigrayan areas, uh, most notably banking services in a few cities and as well as, you know, uh, telecommunication lines being restored in some areas. And now uh, we, we, we are hearing the acceleration of these efforts after after the trip. Ethio Telecom, uh, the, the state-owned telecom operator and the largest telecom operator in Ethiopia, uh, said that it's connecting more than 20 Tigrayan cities and towns uh, and, and uh, providing uh, phone lines as well as internet services in the coming uh, in, 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 in the coming weeks. Uh, and Ethiopian Airlines, as you said, also announced that they are resuming passenger flights to Makale tomorrow. So uh, we are seeing all these uh, all these developments, which indeed indicates that this is a momentous uh, a moment. This is a significant moment. Okay. So with all those developments, where do we stand with the demand um, of the withdrawal of the Eritrean and Amhara militia? Will that impact on the peace deal? Uh, well, that's the fear. Uh, while this uh, cessation of hostilities agreement that was signed early in November in uh, in Pretoria was uh, was hailed as a positive de development to uh, end this really brutal civil war, and uh, we are seeing all these developments that I've mentioned. Uh, we must remember that it's not a perfect one. There are thorny issues. Uh, there are complicated issues, and one of them is uh, the continued pro presence of uh, these forces, particularly Eritrean troops. They have been. They have continued to be accused of abuses, uh, something that they deny, uh, but uh, they're not party to the agreement. Uh, and it's, 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 not, it's, it's clear how, it's not clear how uh, the government is going to uh, enforce, uh, you know, the demand by Tigrayan forces that they need to withdraw from Tigrayan territories immediately. Okay, and, and watching all this, of course, is the AU, because they set up this deal. Has there been any response from them? Uh, well, they haven't said uh, much uh, in, in, in recent days. There was a statement from uh, from the, the, the regional bloc, uh, East African regional bloc, IGAD, uh, hailing you know this this uh, this latest developments. But uh, last week's. Speaking in, in Nairobi, uh, former Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta, who is uh, one of uh, the three mediators appointed by the AU, said that uh, all foreign forces uh, will leave the ground. That's that, that's what he said. Uh, but you know, these Eritrean troops—they are not directly mentioned uh, in the agreement, and as I said, they are not party to the agreement. So uh, we can expect some complications in terms of uh, achieving that particular uh, that particular close. And Kalkadan, I wonder if I could just very quickly ask you just how perilous is the humanitarian um, situation within Tigray, or are things slowly getting better? Uh, indeed, uh, after the, the signing of the agreement, we have seen uh, a, 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 an improvement which can be called significant in terms of uh, the, the flow of aid into Tigray. Uh, uh, flights, you know, uh, carrying aid uh, have have. Uh, continued to the cry and there, there there are also four different corridors in which aid is being delivered on the road this includes uh, food cash fuel and uh, this medical uh, essential medical supplies but we must remember that uh, whatever is being done so far is not sufficient uh, when it's compared with the the, the, the amount of uh, need the, the magnitude of need you know, the magnitude of the, the magnitude of the need in Tigray millions of people are in desperate need they have been uh, on the brink of famine. Uh, uh, hundreds of thousands have been on the brink of famine for, for months, uh, and there are still shortage of medical supplies. So there are improvements, but still more needs to be done. Well, thank you very much for that update. Kalkadanya Beltel there. Thank you. Now, in Ivory Coast, a tech entrepreneur has invented what can best be described as a truly inclusive smartphone. You'll know that voice assistance on your phone is nothing new these days, but its use of local languages is transformational, especially when it comes to reaching more than half of the Ivorian population who can't read, write, or are visually impaired. Imagine that, 50% of the population. Well, this particular phone gives users access to voice commands in over 17 of the country's indigenous languages. The BBC's Anne Okumu has more. Right. 
Amel Asi lives in Plateau, a district in Ivory Coast capital, Abidjan. He has a disability. He's visually impaired. As a result, he has limited access to communication devices. I cannot read or write. Communication for me is a big challenge because I have no access to mobile phones. The ones that are available are hard to navigate. According to UNESCO, Ivory Coast has a population of over 27 million people, but only about 50% have access to education and are able to read and write. Armel is one of many who have not been to school and is unable to read and write. He speaks mainly Ate, a local Ivorian language, and understands basic French. The phones in stores are mostly configured in French and sometimes English. If it was available also in our local languages, it means that illiterate and visually impaired people like me can learn and would have access to mobile services. The most recent report published in 2020 by the global social media management platform Hootsuite says that 40% of the Ivorian population have access to smartphones. But a number of Ivorians are not able to use smartphones because they are not digitally literate and special needs are not usually catered for. But Elaine Kapuchichi, founder of OpenG Smartphone, has developed a smartphone that operates in over 70 local languages spoken in Ivory Coast. One of the major obstacles for access to technology in Africa is that most of the older generations do not know how to read and write. Technology favors written commands, so they hardly use it. So OpenG is a phone that is operated using voice commands and interprets and responds to voice commands in our local languages. The smartphone innovation was launched in July 2021 and has so far sold over 10,000 phones. Other companies have developed similar types of phones. Ghanaian tech company Mobobi has developed a phone that operates in Ghanaian dialect called Twi. U.S. company Mozilla is also creating one that uses Swahili, of which there are an estimated 100 million speakers in East Africa. The voice assistant is not a new technology, but voice assistance in local language is innovative. There is also room to create a social network in local languages and local applications by African developers. Like the rest of the world, new mobile phone technologies continue to emerge across Africa. The hope is that with technological advancements, mobile phone companies can overcome language barriers. They will also be able to accommodate sections of the African population that are socio-economically at a disadvantage. Anno Kumu, BBC, Abidjan. Well, still to come, the English Premier League has returned as Liverpool signed the Dutch ringer Cody Gapko in the December transfer window. We lift everything, we lift everything. Behind every headline. There is a human story. This is our world. History is important. A true sense of belonging. It's a living culture. A series of documentary films that reveal the human drama at the heart of global events. When you allow a country to take away one of your rights, you give that same country permission to take away all of your rights. There are different experiences. There are different kinds of people. Our World on BBC World News. Welcome back to Focus on Africa. Um, let's bring you a more heartbreaking story here in the UK, which we've been following. It is now a month since a coroner concluded that the death of a two-year-old boy was directly linked to exposure to mould at his family home in Rochdale, near Manchester in Northern England. Well, now campaigners say racism could be putting more lives at risk.
Awab Ishak, whose parents are from Sudan, died in 2020 from a severe respiratory condition after living in a flat with severe mould, despite his family raising the issue for more than three years. The housing association responsible for the property has apologised for making what were described as assumptions about the family's lifestyle. Well, now government figures show that black and Asian people in England are three times more likely to live in homes with damp. Our community affairs correspondent Adina Campbell has the report. The nightmare. <laughs> we had two buckets for the bathroom. One to catch the water and one to flush the toilet with. Because for Nicole Sinclair's kitchen ceiling has been leaking for more than five years. And this is how she lives every day. I've got these two buckets. I try to contain as much as I can of this. She moved into this tower block flat in West London with her 10-year-old daughter in 2012. And there are other serious problems. You basically need an umbrella. She's not allowed to go in the toilet without an umbrella or a rain mac on when the leaks are in the bathroom because I don't know what that substance is and I don't want it to touch her. The tower block is owned by Ealing Council and she's spent years raising these disrepair issues. But no one from the council has been out to fix a serious problem since before the pandemic. I drive past Grenfell to go to work when we're talking about never forget and you're letting tower blocks continue to fall into such disrepair that they, they're becoming into this state, then no lessons have been learned and no, you don't really care. Ealing Council says it's truly sorry that Miss Sinclair and her daughter are living in these appalling conditions and has been working for some time to resolve complex plumbing problems in the building. It says it will now urgently review options available and reassess her situation. Is actually housing deprived. Race equality campaigners say Nicole's story is widespread due to a broken housing system and discrimination facing families from black and Asian backgrounds. We know that racism continues to be a factor in the experience of people and where they're able to live. And we know uh, that housing deprivation is, is, a, is a killer and is a long-term killer as well in that it sh shortens life. Latest government figures show people from ethnic minority groups in England are three times more likely to live in damp homes compared with white people. And this is supported by more evidence in a report carried out by the housing charity Shelter last year. It found black people are almost five times more likely to experience discrimination when looking for a safe, secure and affordable home than white people, while Asian people are three times more at risk. And both groups are twice as likely to live in a home with significant mould, condensation or damp problems than white people. That's what happened to two-year-old Awabishak, who died after being exposed to mould at his family home in Rochdale. The housing association responsible for the property has apologised for making assumptions about the family's lifestyle. Victims of, of prejudice. Their case and others were addressed by the housing secretary Michael Gove in Parliament last month. And there have been other examples of uh, individuals in both the private rented sector and the social rented sector who've been treated with significantly less respect than they deserve because of attitudes that are rooted in prejudice. And I think we all have a responsibility across this house to call that out when it occurs. By telling me, I'm with Back in West London, Nicole fears her. things won't change for her family anytime soon. I've started at repairs and gone all the way up to the chief exec. I've left the chief exec and gone to our local MP. I've left a local MP and notified Michael Gove himself. What am I supposed to do? Where do I go after this? There's nowhere for me to go. Adina Campbell, BBC News. Across Nairobi, there are a growing number of electric powered motorcycles on the roads as more startups target the growing industry in and around Kenya. 10 times less polluting than the combustion engine, they're known as Boda Bodas, and it's part of the government's plans to fight climate change. To make it all more attractive, there is a new scheme which is allowing e-motorcyclists to swap out their low battery for a fully charged one. Yasha Michel has more. An electric revolution is unfolding in Kenya's capital, Nairobi. The rise of the use of electric motorcycles over combustion engine motorbikes, which environmental experts say are 10 times more polluting than cars. 
Over recent months, swapping stations have cropped up around Nairobi where electric motorcyclists can exchange their low battery for a fully charged one. It's also cheaper to run, something that has benefited some motorcycle taxi drivers. I took this bike because it does not need a lot of services like a normal bike. With a normal bike, I will use fuel worth approximately 700 to 800 Kenyan shillings. But with this bike, when I swap a battery, I get one battery 300 shillings, so two batteries is 600 shillings per day. East Africa's biggest economy is betting on electric-powered motorcycles, its renewables-led power supply, and its position as a technology and startup hub to lead the region's shift to zero-emission electric mobility. The battery swapping system not only saves time, essential for Kenya's more than one million motorcyclists, but also saves buyers money as many sellers follow a model in which they retain ownership of the battery, the bike's most expensive part. Financial sense to the riders is that they have to, from the revenue they make, they have to save more because that is the only way they, they can increase their their income is by reducing the operational costs and that's how we started looking at electric two-wheelers and unfortunately what we could find in the market and the market here being China was it was not really designed for the African market and that is based on our experience from what we, we were able to order off the shelf to test and to get a product that is able to meet our needs we have had to go through three revisions and this has given us a product that now meets all the needs for us as a business as also the end customers. There are several Nairobi-based electric motorcycle startups working to prove themselves in Kenya before eventually expanding in East Africa. The sector is still really early. Um, we're currently putting 120 bikes on the road. By the end of the year we'll have um, 250 on the road with 700 e-bikes as well alongside them. So we'll be getting close to that 1,000 vehicles on the road point this year. We're also expanding into to Kampala, Dar es Salaam will be similar numbers on the road. So we're really going to go from a few hundred vehicles in 2022 to 2024, um, us going up to tens of tens of thousands of bikes and also in the whole sector as a whole probably going up to around 100,000 plus electric bikes on the road across Africa within the next two to three years. With electricity access in the country over 75 percent according to the World Bank, the country's power utility estimates it generates enough to charge two million electric motorcycles a day, indicating that this electric revolution could be here to stay. Nyasha Michel, BBC News. OK, a bit of sport and it's all about the football today. English Premier League action and Liverpool have agreed to sign Netherlands forward Cody Gakpo from PSV Eindhoven. His father is of Ghanaian descent and had an impressive World Cup in Qatar, scoring three goals as he helped the Netherlands reach the quarterfinals. His fee, well, expected to be between 35 and 44 million pounds. And speaking of Liverpool, the team made a winning return to the Premier League with an entertaining victory over Aston Villa, ensuring the Reds reduced the gap to the Champions League places to five points. Meanwhile, league leaders Arsenal sit comfortably in the top spot with their own 3-1 defeat of West Ham. Ghana's Eddie Nketaya supplied their third goal after Bukoyo Saka opened the scoreline, followed quickly by a Gabriel Martinelli strike. The Gunners are now seven points ahead of second-placed Newcastle United. In what is described as a uniquely South African story of hope, courage and grit, six young people from marginalised communities will be making sailing history come the new year. Captained by 30-year-old former herdsman Subusiso Sizato, the crew will set sail riding the waves between two iconic cities in one epic ocean dash for the South Atlantic Trophy. The Cape to Rio Yacht Race will be marking its 50th anniversary, showing that this is a sport not just for the preserve of the wealthy. The BBC's Daniel Dadsey has the report. The first time he saw the ocean, Sibusiso Sizatu was amazed by the size of what he initially took to be a lake. Because growing up, I spent eight years without, without even knowing there's something called the ocean or the sea. 
And then on my ninth year, I was driving along the coast of Musingbeck on my way to Masipumede on Komiki Road. Then it was the first time to see this big dam like close to the road. And then even then, I didn't even know it's a sea, it's the ocean. I thought it's a big dam. Sibusiso spent his early years herding livestock until at the age of 10, his family moved to a suburb of Cape Town. That was where he was introduced to sailing by an NGO. 20 years after that first encounter, the former head boy is getting ready to sail across that same ocean in an iconic race, helming an all South African team that hopes to inspire a new generation of black yachtsmen. To those who didn't believe that a guy like me who come from the rural area to a township can actually skip a boat across the ocean to Rio. So I think it's going to be an eye opener for the youngsters out there and uh, they're going to start thinking hard about joining this kind of sport as well. So I am excited and I am very happy about this, the, the sport and the team as well is very excited. On 2nd January, he will set off from the southern tip of the African continent towards Brazil for the 50th edition of the legendary Cape to Rio Yacht Race, encompassing some 6,600 kilometers as the longest sailing competition in the Southern Hemisphere. His crew of four men and one woman is the first group from the Royal Cape Yacht Club's Sailing Academy to take part in the race. The academy was set up in 2012 to help youngsters from marginalized communities make it in a sport dominated by the rich. The sport teaches you also a lot. It teaches you how to work together as a team. It teaches you how to be focused and concentrate as well. And being on the ocean is just, you know, away from everything, everything bad on land. So that's why it's good. Their boat, the Archangel, will be racing against more than a dozen other boats from five countries. Sezatsu believes his crew has a strong chance of victory, but being at the starting line is arguably already a success for the skipper. Daniel Daze, BBC News. And fair winds at Archangel. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.